And welcome back to another UNC Tar Heels basketball recruiting podcast here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. And if you're checking us out on our fast growing YouTube channel that is called Tar Heel Illustrated, I am THI publisher Andrew Jones. And joining me is our director of basketball recruiting, Mr. David Sis. David is a longtime coach in this business. He's done AAU, college, high school, and he's been scouting kids for a long, long time. Coached some guys that played in the league, ACC, SEC, and so on. So David has been in this sport for a long time. He knows what he's looking at, and things are changing on the recruiting landscape. And that's kind of what we're going to hit on in this podcast. We're going to first talk about five kids in the class of 2023 that have UNC offers. And then we're really going to talk about just how recruiting is different. And David has some interesting perspectives on the direction things are going. But David, let's first get it off. Let's hit on five kids in the class of 23. The one we've talked about the most in this group uh, since you were hired, and even before you were hired, we were doing stuff on Robert Dillingham. But here he is. He's a, a class of 23, six foot one point guard from Lincolnton, North Carolina, the number eight prospect in the nation. People in the state of North Carolina have been aware of him. Uh, for a couple of years now. So your thoughts on Robert Dillingham and kind of the early, still early stages, I think, about where this recruitment is and and Carolina's chances down the road of perhaps landing him. Yeah, all of these are incredibly um, early. So it, it's not like they're finalists. Any of these programs are finalists or anything like that, um, or you're we're already narrowing it down to four or five schools. Uh, the thing, and we're going to get, like you say, we're going to get into uh, the way the recruiting landscapes change. But in 2023, uh, and I told you this, to me, it's more interesting than 2022, even though, you know, there's still a player or two out there that, that they could add, that Hubert could add, <coughs> Kim Whitmore and others, uh, perhaps. But 2023, they're really going back, back to the blue blood recruitment that you would expect from a North Carolina and a Duke and a Kentucky and a Kansas and, and people like that, where it's uh, it's a five-star situation. Yeah. And if you look at all three guys, they're all five stars. They're all in the top 20. I think probably all being a top 15, at least when the next rankings come out. Uh, so, you know, you're going to have to compete with overtime league and G league. And we, you know, I don't know if we've ever mentioned the overtime league before on this podcast, but it's very relevant. Uh, the NBL, the national basketball league based out of Australia. Uh, so there are a lot of options there. Uh, and Robert Dillingham is going to be faced with a lot of those. Like you say, he's number eight, right? He's a finalist, uh, for, uh, I saw over the weekend. For Team USA, uh, 16 and under team, I think it is, uh, the 2021 team. Uh, so, uh, he, he obviously, he's got a lot, very good, and got a lot of stuff going for him, as, as North Carolina fans know. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and give the names of the other four kids, because I think you're going to be, we're going to be weaving into this five-star element of the conversation. Gigi Jackson, six foot nine power forward from Columbia, South Carolina, the number 20 player in the nation. J.J. Taylor, 674 in Chicago, number four player in the nation. Mackenzie McBacco, pardon me if I'm butchering oh, that, 6'8", six eight, six eight small forward from Gladys. We had to pull Jersey. it out of you, but you got it right. I, I got it out. I'm not doing it again. Number five prospect in the nation. And the lowest rated of the bunch, who actually is a guy who could move up here at some point, Matas Guzelis, six foot eight forward. Uh, he's from Wolf. Uh, Borough, New Hampshire, but he's from overseas. You did an interview with him here recently. Lives in Chicago, actually. Yeah, lives in Chicago, he but the goes school he attends is in New Hampshire. Hampshire. Yeah. He's the number 42 player in the class. He's a guy that has a really good chance of, of rising. If you watch his film, he's got a lot of game, big time, well-rounded game. So in this group, this is a different element than what they got. They did get Jalen Washington, and they did go after some other guys. Seth Trimble's moving up, that kind of thing, but why do you think that Hubert is going for the five-star kid in this group as opposed to jumping into 22 and taking a Will Shaver as your first commitment? And perhaps in it, maybe they get Cam Whitmore, who right now I think is 96. He's going to move up, but yeah. he's not going to be top 15 probably. No, and, you know, there, there's different ways of doing it. And I would like to get like an entire list and just go through and look at coaches 
and say, for example, with Juwan Howard, who's killing it on a recruiting trail, former NBA player, alum, uh, alumnus of uh, Michigan, a lot of stuff going forward that Hubert Davis has, has got going, and, and he's one of the top recruiters in the country now. I mean, Michigan's right up there with a year in and year out now of everybody. But I would like to see how he started out in that first class. I really need to go back and look. But, you know, living in Tennessee, I, I'm, I'm around a lot of Tennessee fans. And I know, for example, like Rick Barnes. Rick Barnes, when he first got to Tennessee, he was one of the least popular hires at the University of Tennessee of, of any football coach, basketball coach, or anything. And I've said this at the University of Tennessee. I figured this out. And I know North Carolina fans don't want to hear about Tennessee, but I'll tell you how inaccurate it is. That if you find a coach that Tennessee fans like when they're hired and they think he's going to do really good, he'll be out of there in three years. If you find a guy that they hate. That's happened a few times. Worst hire ever, it's going to be a great hire. You know, Rick Barnes was a – basically a parachute package to go into retirement because he was a his good old boy network out of uh, uh, Gardner Webb, I think it was, or Lenore Ryan. Lenore Ryan, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so his buddy from uh, Hart from, from Lenore Ryan. But the, the criticism of Rick Barnes was nobody saw him for two years. He didn't recruit anybody. Well, what Rick Barnes was doing, he was really working on player development and he was building that product and all and when he started hitting those guys Tennessee was attractive now North Carolina's a whole different thing North Carolina's attractive but what I'm saying is not all that first year they always don't come out with guns blazing with these top guys that's what I'm trying to say uh I'll give you another example they hold on let me let me stop you I what you're saying is <clears throat> they need to get guys they need, mm -hmm. they need to get some hit they need to hit on a few bring him in and he's already got some players too. So these 23 kids are going to see a full cycle of North Carolina under Hubert Davis before any, before any of them make any decisions. So get some wins on the recruiting trail, get some wins on the court of the next year. And by then after recruiting these kids for a year and they see the full package that Hubert has to offer, then you're saying he can kind of go in for the kill for lack yeah. of a better term. And my, I give you a story. My roommate at the time, back 15 years ago or longer, uh, well, a roommate before then, um, he um, he had gotten hired by Buzz Peterson when he was at Tennessee, and he had AAU ties with Corey Brewer. And he told Buzz at that time, he said, look, if you're bringing me in to try to get Corey Brewer, you need to hire somebody else. Because these other schools have been – on him for two years. They've built a relationship with these coaches. I don't care how close I am to him. I'm not going to get him. You know, it's not going to happen. And so I think Hubert realizes that. Why go in on a guy that you really don't even know that you've not recruited when Coach K or Calipari or Jay Wright or whoever have been on him for two years? You know, so I think you will see Hubert Davis. We'll see what he can do as a recruiter with this second class because he's had time now to build relationships with Dillingham and Gregory Jackson and, and, and individuals like that. So um, that's when we'll see. But it's a lot more real, realistic that you can go get the top-notch players uh, after you've had a year or even longer to recruit. Going back to Dillingham, I've read a lot of people's takes on him when I've talked about him and a few others. He, he's the real deal. He's the kind of kid that wherever he goes, he steps in probably first year, gets the ball, runs a show, and be a pretty good college player from the outset, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, you know, Robert Dillingham's not going to go somewhere to develop, sit on the bench. Um, you know, any of these guys that you look at, you're talking about one and dones. You know, I don't think Robert Dillingham's going somewhere to play two or three years. And now, like I said, with that, then comes in all this other stuff from these other leagues, and then we bring in name, image, likeness, and all that. It turns into, you know, some some other uh, factors in his recruitment that in the past you wouldn't have had. But he'll be a player that demands that because, you know, you take Robert Dillingham at North Carolina, an in-state kid, what would his name, image, and likeness worth be in the state of North Carolina? 
it'd be huge. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, like I said, it's, he's, he's a player like that. When you look at him, everybody knows he's going to be a pro. Uh, and, you know, he, he's not going to be there over multiple years. He's a guy that comes in, you know, comes right in and starts, has a huge impact as a freshman, and then he's off to the drought. Gigi Jackson, and we're, like I said, we're going to go over these five very quickly, and then we're going to talk about the bigger picture uh, with, the, with 23 and the other things that coaches are going to have to recruit against, not just other programs. Uh, six, nine, four, like I said, Columbia, South Carolina, uh, what do you know about him as a player? And let's kind of take it from there. His numbers with CP3 and the Peach Jam are just ridiculous as, as playing a year up. And uh, I know Jamie Shaw watched them a lot. And Jamie's been as giddy about him as anybody in that 2022 class. You know, and I wasn't surprised as soon as it was over and he did an article about who really boosted her stock in Peach Jam in, in 23. I knew whose name was going to be there, and I didn't speak to him about it, but I, I knew as much as he had tweeted and, and, and did some posts and some threads and just raved about Gigi and uh, just it, – it was, it was huge. You know, and he, he goes on to the MBPA – and he puts up like numbers, and then this is not a fluke, or he does it one or two times. I mean, he's playing, he's played a lot this summer over and over against the best players in America, and it's just been one game after another where he's just double doubled. Uh, so he, he he's going to be, and I would be very surprised if he's not top 10 when the next rankings come out. I think he's really going to have Jamie on the rival side. He's really going to have Jamie pushing hard for him, I believe, from everything I've seen. And I think it'd be interesting to see where he's at. But I, I, I think he can fall out of bed and he'll be in the top 10 when the next one's come out. Well, J.J. Tanner is already there. He's number four, yeah. six foot seven forward. Yeah. Uh, what do you know about him? Uh, J.J. Taylor uh, plays with uh, uh, Mac Irvin Fire. Um, I've known about him for a while because, uh, you know, when you really kind of keep up with some of these kids out of places like – the next one out of New York City, out of Chicago, out of Atlanta, out of places like that, you know, and he's had that reputation as the next great one uh, out of that area. And just he's got everything you want. He's got skill. You know, he's a six eight wing, six seven wing. Got the frame, long, uh, ultra athletic, can shoot out outside shot. Just. He's got the complete package. Um, you know, I, I don't know who is going to be in as far as, as, you know, talking about Gigi. Uh, but uh, you would think North Carolina with, with even Columbia, South Carolina, you know, North Carolina has that influence basketball wise in the Carolinas, be it North Carolina or South Carolina. We know that. Uh, but, you know, him being from Chicago, um, I don't know who all, you know, would be on the, the inside there. Uh, but I think through Sean May, Hubert Davis is really trying to make Chicago a, a um, hotbed for North Carolina recruits. You know, you already look at Jalen Washington, so he's brought one in there. Uh, and then this offer, Matos Bazelis or Matos Bazelis, you know, like we said, he's from Chicago. So, there were two back-to-back -back offers plus a player that's committed, all three from uh, the Chicago land area. Yeah, and when people think of Chicago, include that northern Indiana. There's a lot of players that come from there. And by the way, we didn't mention, but Dillingham has the, the Jeff McGinnis connection. Matos, Matos Bazelis, who you just said, he's the number 42 player. Uh, just tell everybody – a little bit about his game, and we'll get on to Mbako, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about the how 2023 is going to be a lot different uh, for what coaches have to deal with than they have in the past. Hubert likes versatility, and it, and it looks – it's funny. I wanted to go back um, before we went on the air here and go back and review each player and just really kind of get my ducks in a row on these guys. And just going back to, to interviews that I'd done with them or interviews that Rob or Jamie had done with them, and all of these guys were saying that they get comparisons to Kevin Durant or Jason Tatum 
or guys like that. So, you know, you do the, you do the math on that one, you know, and put the visual together. You're talking about bigger wings, um, guys who can even go out and stretch the floor, uh, but are playmakers at that spot who can not just, just stretch guys who catch and shoot, but we, we've addressed this before. Guys who are bigger in a bigger frame now are new age, you know, uh, playmakers who can score in multiple ways, who can create for others. So they've got a, a, a lot of those guys seem to be very, very similar, uh, you know, especially uh, with some of these guys that we mentioned and, and you put Buzelis in that, uh, in that category. Didn't he tell you that he loves to be, see himself as a playmaker, as a guy that can create something yeah. from any spot? Because people think still, they think playmaker, they think a guy at the ball at the top, but I think he kind of told you he can make plays from anywhere on the court, starting anywhere. Yeah. He's flying around. I'd kind of prepared with some answers here. I, I kind of put two and two together and knew where some of these conversations would go here. And, you know, I compare it, the, the change, I think of basketball, it's more subtle sometimes. We don't see it out in the open. I'd compare it to football. You know, how to football, the game, how it changed from, a tight end and a fullback to five wide receivers or four wide receivers and uh, one running back. And then you get to the H back. But if you look at how some, how now the big weapon, you know, for a long time, a tight end got to be obsolete a little bit. And now you've got these bigger receivers who can run and they're, they, they kind of play in a slot a little bit. And, they're too fast for linebackers. They're too big for cornerbacks and safeties. And they just chew defenses up. And, and teams in the NFL and college are always looking for guys like that. And, and they always, uh, you know, seem to work, you know, because they're hard to guard. I go look at the college game now in the pro game in NBA. And um, we talked about, you know, catch and shoot guys. Instead, we've always talked about that six, that Robert Ory kind of guy who just yeah. stretches and shoots threes and is really good at it. Bigs have a hard time getting out to them. And then you started going to guys and putting the ball on the floor and can make the threes and can and can get to the get to the mid range. Then guys got a little bit better. Then they can get to the rim and they can pass and they can handle it. So they've gotten they play like six one guards, and and now. It's kind of going back maybe in a way, maybe never got away from it. You know, you look at LeBron with the Lakers, uh, and even when he was with the Cavaliers and with Heat and all that, he was never just a deadly three-point shooter. But he was a guy who obviously was built like a tank, like a freight train. He was 6'8", 270, and he just get downhill into the lane. There's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Now, go back and look at Milwaukee, you know, with Giannis. Giannis is not a good outside shooter, but Giannis at his size, he didn't post up. LeBron really doesn't post up. They were able, and you look at them and you say, okay, they got a center and then you've got a Giannis. So they've gone to a big lineup. Not really. I know you still got that post to might play in the dunker spot in short corner, but you take a look at what Giannis did. Giannis played on a perimeter and now he's got all these shooters around him. So you can't play off those guys. Yeah. And you just didn't have enough help. You can't pack the lane on him. So what's he do? He gets a ball on the wing or the top of the key, and it's just spread out with four guys and a guy in the dunker spot. And he just gets into the lane with a ball on the drive. There's nothing you can do about it. So he's basically scoring 40 points a night on the NBA in the NBA finals, just driving from the top. Yeah. And it looked it's not a set offense. It's not a play. It's just we got shooters. We'll spread it. Now, if you want to help and put guys in, he'll kick to somebody and he'll knock down a three. So do you, you want to make them work for the two or do you want to give up the three? What do you, and you really don't have an answer. So that's where it's kind of going with these guys now. And I can see the change, the face of it just kind of changing. And now, like you say, they're, they're, they're much more into the playmaking, not only scoring, but kind of setting the table simply because these guys can shoot. These guys can put it on the floor. They can handle it. And they can, they can read defense and hit open teammates. You know, David, it wasn't that long ago when a coach would call something from the side sideline and it would be a clear out and they'd reset the offense and the guys would clear out and the dude would make a move. 
They don't have to do that anymore because they're already cleared out. Yeah. And going back to football, and, and it, it changes, you know, with the size. Like we said, who, who thought that you were going to see a 10, 10 years ago, 6, 11, and 7-foot perimeter players? You know, and you look like in the NFL. Who thought you would see as many quarterbacks that you're seeing now under six feet tall and yeah. guys scrambling around? You remember when quarterbacks didn't scramble? You didn't want the guy getting outside the pocket and they were considered runners and not passers and they looked different and they played differently than they do now. And it's just – But you remember the NFL – the evolution of, of all team sports. The NFL snubbed their nose at Doug Flutie 38 years ago, 37 years ago because he was 5'11 and a half. Yeah. Well, the guy, the guy at North Carolina may not be – he's pushing six feet and he could be the new one picking the draft next year. It's changed. It's yeah. changed dramatically in that sense. And basketball, I, I, it is fascinating to me. When I was reading your piece about uh, the Zealots, I, it really just kind of – and I, I've known this, obviously. I've covered the game. I've been around, been around it so much for so long. But it kind of really hit home. Like, there are very few of these kids that don't see themselves as either already playmakers or they're wannabe playmakers because the game has changed so much. Yeah, and you look at like even, you know, it's not been that long ago where, um, what, three or four years ago, Baker Mayfield, how long has Baker Mayfield been in the league? Three or four oh, years? Yeah. yeah. Tops. And you remember when there was a lot of controversy when he was drafted because he was too small. Yeah. And now you don't, you don't ask that anymore about these games. You know, you, That's I who mean, Sam House compared to. Justin Fields or – uh, Kyler Murray or some of those guys, it's just now, I mean, if there's a, a quarterback next year, it wins a Heisman at 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 and he's got a strong arm and he can run around, man, that guy's going to get drafted and nobody's going to – he's going to get drafted up at the top. Nobody's going to ask a question about it. Yeah. Well, uh, Mackenzie Mbako, uh, six foot eight kid out of uh, New Jersey, number five player in the class, is he just like these other guys? What's he like? Yeah, he's – he uh, – that was a young team. He played for the New Jersey Scholars, and they had DeJuan Wagner Jr. They had a bunch of 16-year-olds. Oh, wow. Did really well. Uh, yeah, another – not quite as big, about that 6'7 range, but could really shoot the ball. Athlete, um, you know, still 6'7 wing, and he's young, so there's no reason to think he's not going to get up to 6'8", 6'9". So he kind of, you know, fits that same bill, top 10 player. One of the top wings in the country, versatile, play multiple positions, guard multiple positions, shoot the ball, put it on the floor, athlete. You know, so Hubert obviously, you know, and he offered these guys just back to back to back to back. Yeah. So, you know, he's identified, you know, what he wants to go with in 2023, man. And it's, it's uh, you know, he, he's going swimming in the deep, deep waters with this class. And, the, and that's where we're, we're going to go with this conversation now. And, and the water is, is it deep just in that Kentucky and Kansas and UCLA and, and uh, all those kinds of programs are into these kids as well, recruiting them. Is he going to have to maybe beat out these leagues you're talking about for a kid down the road? Is that going to become the norm where the kid releases this top five? There may be five schools there, but maybe some kids actually going to say, the NBL, the all these different leagues, as well as Kentucky, North Carolina, Kansas. Are we every, headed there with the class of 23? Every kid I'm seeing, with the exception, and I, I, I've stayed with 2022 pretty – I've watched it pretty closely. And these top guys, with the exception of Keontae George, who committed to Baylor, he had Texas, Baylor, Kansas, Oklahoma State, Kentucky, end up going to Baylor – He's been the only top kid I've seen that's not had at least one uh, NBA or NBA, had one professional option. Most of these guys that I'm seeing have G League and – or not G League, overtime league and National Basketball League. I think the G League probably comes in a little bit later. But now it's turning in uh, to really an all-out war because name, image, and likeness has – really squared the playing field, uh, has leveled it. Um, I'll give you an example. Everybody, I think most people followed Jalen during and his recruitment. 
up to about two weeks before he committed, Jalen Duran was a lock, if there ever was one, for the GoPro. Nobody in the world thought that he, not one, thought he was going to go college. Everybody thought he was going to go G League. And you look at some of the offers. I mean, he turned down 1.5 million and to go to Memphis. And a lot of people think that what he'll make at Memphis in, in NIL with FedEx and Nike, their second biggest um, uh, basic outlet is in Memphis. And, and what I mean by that is, is headquarters, terminals, things like that. They got a huge presence. And they think, well, he could make in one year at Memphis a dwarf 1.5 million. And so now uh, Gary Parrish had a great article, and I've been reading up a lot on the overtime league. The overtime league, Jeff Bezos, Drake, uh, Kevin Durant, they're all uh, investors started this. I would say they probably got over $100 million in capital now. They started out with $85 million. And uh, that's going into these players. So they're offering – they're offering 2023 kids. So you're seeing 2023 kids uh, basically reclass, graduate, go there. They've, all, they've already targeted some. They're going there. They're signing two-year contracts for like $500,000 a year. They still get name, image, and likeness. They, um, If they want to go to college later on, uh, tuition will be paid for. Um, they get, they've got the health insurance. They've got uh, all kinds of things that go with that. Um, and uh, they're also uh, offered part ownership in the league, a percentage of that that they can buy back into. Hey, but so if you're advising, uh, let me jump in. If you're advising one of these kids, you're telling me this, and I'm thinking about the money they have up front. And I'm thinking, who's going to watch this week? Okay, they have money right now to spend on this stuff, but at what point does that money run out and how much are they bringing back in? Because college basketball viewership has gone down. I don't know if there's an appetite. The G League doesn't register in the ratings at all. And those guys are professionals. I don't know where something like this, where the market is for it. So if you're advising a kid, especially if you're telling a kid he gets a percentage of the league, I mean, is that really a percentage of anything? I set through a name image, and I didn't know this at the time, I got name dropped for an individual when I was at, down in Hoover at the Adidas in July. And a buddy of mine said, do you want to, um, hey, man, we, the, we got a couple of guys, so these guys here, you want to go out and eat with them? And I said, man, I'd love to. He dropped the names. And and I said, you know, I dream dropped too. And I said, Andrew Jones is slaving me. I've got to go. I got to get back to the room and work here at two in the morning and get up. I'm sure stuff. that worked very well for you. So, so anyway, he, uh, he said, you are going to, you're telling me you're going to miss going out and uh, having late night dinner with these names. And he dropped it off. And I said, all right, you're right. I'll go. So I had no idea. It was going to be a name, image, and likeness um, presentation from a guy who had already started his corporation, had multiple million-dollar investors, donors, who were businessmen, who were basically saying, go get the players, bring the players to this. Here's the money to advertise with. We want them to advertise with us. They were business owners. So... I just listened, but it had already been developed. It had been years in the making because they knew it was going to happen. And once name, image, and likeness happened, they were ready to go that moment. Uh, unlike the NCAA and unlike a lot of colleges, you know, they were, they, they were proactive. The reason I say this is because you're asking the same question about the overtime league's investment. Uh, they were basically offering free representation, legal representation, uh, really something player friendly. And the guy who put this together says, look, I won't make a penny off this. Okay. We're, this is a non, this is almost like a, a, a nonprofit organization. And I'm thinking, well, why in the world would you do this for free? Exactly. And the thing is, I think they're hoping on down the road 
when these kids go back and sign huge NBA contracts, that they're going to be able – that they like what they did for them so much. Oh, they'll be able to have the representation for them when they're stars yeah. in the NBA. That's where it comes. And I wonder if the G League's like that right now. It's just an investment, you know, for these kids on down the road to – be able, you know, they've got the ownership, be able to invest back into that. Yeah. And also maybe you're giving them representation through agencies, through things like that, through business managers, through all of that, where they can say, Hey, I trust you enough to where, you know, we're going to, I'm going to let you in on this to represent me, to be my agency, to be my business, my marketers, my business managers, all that. They're going to offer all this stuff most likely. So that that's the route that I see. So right now, it, it you know, it's like 15, 20 years ago when you had all these high tech startups and yeah. it, you could buy a, a you know, they started out $1 a share in a week or $5,000 a share yeah. and they hadn't shown one cent of profit. Do you remember that? I, I mean, they're that. like, the, I mean, these guys hadn't made a penny off of it. And, but then on down the road, they, you know, all of a sudden just overnight they're billionaires. So yeah. I don't know that it goes to that extent, but I, I, I and that's just my opinion of what they may be looking at. So that's part of the competition. So when, let me when, say NBL too. And yeah, so when Carolina fans are thinking about, and I'm just going to use Dillingham as an example. I'm not saying he's going to go to one of these leagues, but don't just think about what college coaches are watching these kids. We're going to have to start trying to figure out what other kind of communication is going on. And, and this, and you and I talked about this when NIL happened. I don't know if we talked about it in a podcast or not, but there are people that believe that the schools like North Carolina, Duke, Kentucky, Kansas are going to be fine. Indiana will be in pretty good shape because how strong its fan base is, how much that they will support these kids like NASCAR fans did in the 90s, that those are the programs that could compete with these leagues because a Dillingham comes to Chapel Hill and boom, he's going to make that money and more. Plus, he's on a different stage. You know, yeah. I go back to Zion. Zion, hit his spending eight months at Duke made him $100 million. Yeah. Even with the, the injury made him even more money in some ways because because of the aura. It's going to be hard to build an aura in these other leagues, but you can build them in college, and there are certain platforms that still allow that. Duke, Kentucky, North Carolina, Kansas. I, I think UCLA is maybe getting back there again. Indiana will be with, with Mike Woodson and the fact that they've got such a massive fan base. There are a few other programs like that. Louisville, you mentioned Memphis. I think Memphis might be a different player now with NIL and having Penny there and like you said, all that money in Memphis. So if you're, if you're telling Carolina fans, when you look into the class of 23, don't just look at the list of schools that have offered. You have to consider these other options for these kids as well as competition for Hubert. And let me run the national basketball, uh, national basketball. Yeah. The, the national basketball league, NBL, um, you know, based out of Australia and, um, their deal is, remember, they had LaMelo Ball and R.J. Hampton, and they kind of really got that ball going in 2000. I think it was 19. Uh, correct me, I, but I think that was due. Yeah. Um, their whole deal is, you know, they offered, like, million-dollar contracts. And they also had shoe and tet time. They were able to do endorsements, which you couldn't do in college, and they had shoe endorsements. So they're, they're doing that. And, and uh, the, the, here was the thing. Uh, when once they got into the NBA draft, the NBA had to buy the rights back from the NBL for them to get drafted because they were the NBL's property. So if Andrew Jones goes to, uh, I don't know, goes to the, yeah, yeah, goes there in place, and you get a million dollar contract, and you're going to get drafted. Let's say you're you're a number 10, number 15 round, you know, you're projected to go uh, uh, number 10 or number 15 in the first round. The NBA has to buy that contract back at the same price, and that goes to you. So you were signed for a million. You get a million dollars from the NBA just to come back to be eligible for a draft instead of you paying them. So you've made $2 million. Plus, you've also got 
the endorsements that you were able to do. I had heard that LaMelo Ball and RJ Hampton both made as much as $5 million in one year, you know, in Australia to come back. So, you know, you've got that too. So that's just another uh, look now uh, as far as pros go, but going back to what you were saying, college has got to be proactive. You can't drag your feet and whether you like it or not, uh, it's here to stay. And I tr trust me on this one. People who say, well, I don't like it, this name, image, and likeness, and players getting paid and all that stuff. Trust me, it could be the saving grace of college basketball. Yeah. Because if you want to get the players that you've been used to getting over the years, the Worthies, and Jordans, and the Vince Carters, and Rashi Wallaces, and all those guys, this is the ball. This is the ballpark now. This is the playing field that you're participating in. And if you don't have that, like I said, every one of these guys would go the professional route because you don't see them staying around four years, playing four years, getting their degree. None of those guys do that in the top. Yeah. So this, like I said, it makes it a level playing field. It gives colleges a chance. Colleges have got to be proactive and get the best package out there to help these players. Players have to know. If I'm going to go to the University of North Carolina, man, they have got something set up that's unmatched. Uh, Jalen Doran said, I'm going to tell you when people started thinking Memphis had a shot at Jalen Doran. He went and said after the Memphis visit, he was blown away. Those were his words. He was blown away by their name, image, likeness presentation. So it's huge. Now, when you go visit, one of the questions we ask, tell us about name, image, likeness presentation. Oh, yeah. That's what it's like, all. You know, that's one of now, the They, they can't about. give the kid, they can't say, hey, you know, this guy, these guys are, 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 uh, are sponsoring this kid. But the information is there. They have to be careful about what they tell these kids. But yeah. They can find out. There are ways that they can get them to find out. It's all kind of out there. And, and at the risk of sounding like, 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 you know, there's there are people out there that say, yeah, they're all getting paid. None of them are going to class. I, I'm not that guy. I've been around it for a long time. I know that most of them do go to class more than those kind of people think that they do. But I'm also not naive enough to think that none of them get paid. Kids have been getting stuff in various forms for years. I'm not saying that they do it in North Carolina. I'm just saying in general for the sport. As you said, this is the saving grace for college basketball. I think one of the good things about NIL is in a lot of ways, it takes some pressure off some of these programs. Yeah. Take some pressure off some of these coaches. They don't have to wheel and deal behind closed doors. This whole thing with Nike a few years ago, that stuff doesn't occur now because you could be more out in the open. The kids can be more out in the open. And it's a lot easier now. The coaches can just kind of, they don't have to worry about that, you know, being lurking over and finding out all the things they're doing. And because of that, I think, again, it comes back to the kinds of programs that could be successful in this current uh, uh, climate, David. Yeah. especially with all the money that's out there. In the end, a guy like Coach K or John Shire, when he takes over, or Bill Self or Hubert Davis, they don't have to tell kids, well, we got a big fan base. We've got this massive platform. They're already going to know that. The kids that are going that are coming up now, they, they know the traditions, they know the banners and that kind of stuff, but they're going to know the NIL stuff. They're going to know the value of the platform. That They're going to know that is probably more than anything else. A lot of kids – everybody that followed that on our site on our message boards, they were so impressed by Cam Whitwell because he said, well, they win national championships talking about Carolina. A lot of kids don't say that stuff anymore. Now, when we interview kids 23 and beyond, a lot of it's going to have to be NIL stuff, but they're going to know, they're going to know that school X, they, those guys don't, the great players don't really get much, but man, school Y, those, even the average players, they get a lot there. That's going to be a huge part of the process and the schools don't North Carolina is not going to have to pitch that too much because guys are going to know what dudes have been getting before that. Yeah. And, and this is my whole take. You, you hear about kids now coming out and are getting astronomical amounts at certain places. You know, they were talking about Nick Saban, you know, Nick Saban wants to be the, the, the ultimate hard butt and the traditionalists and all that. You remember when he was talking about his uh, quarterback, my quarterbacks may already made a million dollars in endorsements and he's not even dressed out yet. And I hate it. He didn't hate it. He threw that out there. That was the biggest yeah. recruiting pitch he's ever made. And uh, 
you know, it, when, when you, when you have that, the word gets out. And like I say, they sell that, but here's my whole thing and my whole take. If a player is getting that from a marketer being marketed and businesses understand I can get advertisement and he can make that much money off of it. Uh, they're worth it. You know, they're, if a player is not worth a million dollars, he's not going to get a million dollars. You know, and th that's the bottom line. And, and trust me, if he comes as quarterback at Alabama and he absolutely just sucks, he will not make a million dollars anymore. I mean, you've got to, you know, there's a thing there where you've got to continue and earn what you're getting or that value is going to drop. So yeah, man, whatever, whatever you know, Quinn you know, Ewers gets at Ohio State the next 12 months, yeah. that's one thing. But once he starts taking snaps in games, that either goes up, it stays where it is, or it falls off the table. Yeah, and I'm a free, I'm a free marketer to the nth degree. Yeah. And uh, the market always decides. Yeah, sure it, it's going to decide who's worth it and who's not worth it. And like I said, that offers some motivation to these kids. So uh, to, to me, if a kid's worth it, why not let them have it? You know, I, I, I don't see I, I don't see the issue. And I think it'll end up working out well. I, I, I don't think in three or four years from now, we we I don't think there's gonna be many people that, that admitted. Well, were you for name image like Yeah, I was for it. I was for it all along. I don't think there's gonna be too many. Now, I may be totally wrong, but I, I, that's the way I see it. Look, it, there's always change. I remember when guys – I remember when in the 70s, I was really, really little, but I remember the term. I grew up in D.C. and I remember Maryland had a player named Brad Davis and he left a year early and called it hardship. I remember it was called the hardship rule back then where guys would leave earlier because their families desperately needed money. That was sort of the take back then, right? And then guys started going because it was time to go. They didn't want to – they go after three years. James Worthy left after three years. MJ left after three years. MJ wanted to come back in some ways for his fourth. And, and then guys started leaving after their sophomore years. You know, uh, that Jerry, Jerry Stackhouse and the She Balls and people like my gosh, only two years. Were they really Tar Heels? And they started leaving after one year. I mean, this, people adapted. They got used to it. When, when people see Jerry Stackhouse highlight reels and Dean Dome now, they embrace that just the same that they do if, they, if it's a four-year guy doing that stuff. So college sports fans have a unique passion. There's, there's something about the DNA of being a college sports fan, a passionate one. Ultimately, they will adjust. I, the ones that say that, they, that they're going to leave are just like the NFL fans that said a few years ago, I'm never coming back because some guys were kneeling. Now look at the NFL ratings. They all came back, obviously. College will be fine. I actually think you're right. I think college basketball saved because of NIL. And, and football to a less, less of a degree because of the three-year rule that the guys have. But – it's going to help football too in a lot of ways. And I actually think it's going to help. It even a field playing field in summer football. In basketball, I do think though it, it weighs a little bit to the powers, it, it, to the programs that have the clear, bigger platforms like the Carolinas, Dukes, and Kentuckys. Yeah. And I understand the whole, you talk about the whole amateurism thing. I, I have an argument with a guy that I work with every day, but he's a Vanderbilt fan. So, you know, you can imagine. So, and I tell him, you know, he, he's totally against this, but the thing is they, they've struggled, especially in football and stuff. They, they've struggled so much. And, you know, so there he's like, well, I don't care. Who, who cares if the top 25 and the top 50 kids go, pro and all that stuff well naturally it, it it probably helped them you know and and i'm not knocking vanderbilt when i say this but i understand there's a motivation behind that but i've told him this amateurism didn't stop when name image and likeness started um and i said okay if you want to make this true amateurism let the high school or college coaches make what high school coaches make. Let them pay them $50,000 a year. See how many of them do it. Yeah. Uh, no more televised games because they're making money off of it. 
No more television, no more ACC network, no more ESPNU, no more games of the week, no more SEC network, no more any of that. Uh, tickets, $5 a piece, and have about a 5,000-seat football stadium and about a 3,000-seat basketball arena, and none of these games are televised. You know, now we're talking amateurism, which is kind of what you have in D3 and D2 to an extent. You know, that, that's the more amateurism. But the thing is, people are getting rich off college sports. And, and I seen – and so, you know, it, it, it was a cartel. And it, well, I heard Michael Wilbon call it a, a cartel 20 years ago. So get that out of the way if you want true amateurism. But anybody that thinks that, that you know, this, there's, it just wasn't a free-for-all cash cow, and it has been – and, you know, everybody was getting paid legally except the players. And then we, we all know what was going on behind the scenes at, at, at schools. Well, so and they've been, I, look, they've also been getting cash. They get, the, 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 they, they all get the, the highest call grants you can get. They get cost of attendance. I've talked with ACC ADs about this. I've talked with um, head coaches about this. And I've told you this before. I had a friend that played basketball at Fordham or Nick McCarchick back in the early 90s. And, and we had a long discussion about eight years ago about the value of his experience. And Fordham, they've always been the dregs of the Atlantic 10, or at least it's still the Atlantic 10. You know, they go play Temple every once in a while and teams like that. And I said, you know, do me a favor. Take this weekend and, and, and evaluate what the value of your experience actually was. And what, what was included there was, okay, you know how parents hire pitching coaches for their kids. They hire a shooting instructor for one-on-one -on -one, and they pay X number of dollars for a 30 or 60 minute session. Well, imagine if his parents wanted to hire Nick McCarchick and his staff to coach him for four years, spend all the time that they do on the court, in the film room, everything to the insurance that they have to pay, the medical care that he gets, then the TV exposure, if you start going to the bigger conferences and the bigger programs like the North Carolinas, there's an unbelievable value in all those things. Imagine if Andrew Playtex's parents had to pay Roy Williams and Steve Robinson, that whole staff in North Carolina, for and pay for use of the facilities and for all the airtime that they got and all the, the connections that he's able to make in that process. It's off the charts. We're talking millions of dollars. So the whole amateur thing is BS because the value of their experience for years has been, it's been considerable. And in the bigger programs, it's in the millions and millions of dollars. And then you throw in there the fact that they are getting compensation, literally. They're getting the scholarship, the room and board. They're getting uh, all that kind of stuff. Plus the players get the cost of attendance. You're talking $23,000 or so in untaxed cash. They get per diems when they're on the road, anything like that. These guys have not been amateurs. So the people that want to cling to that need to understand that you've been rooting for something passionately for a long time in which the value of the experience was far more than most people talked about because a lot of people were pushing, the kids aren't getting anything, just a, a textbook and a class spot in a classroom. Well, they've been getting a lot more. Now they're getting even more. Now they're able to make money off their life. But now I think there. in a short term, they're getting what they're worth. Yeah, I agree. And they should. And, well, I go back when I was in Indianapolis in April covering for Tar Heel Illustrated, the Midwest Mania. Event. And I, I remember getting out of the gym and, and had the radio on, went by ESPNU on, I got XM radio, went by that. And uh, every North Carolina fan's favorite voice, Dan Dockich, was on on the Saturday night. And it was a taped show because I'd heard the same thing a couple of days ago. But Dan Dockich is going on about, you know, his son played at Michigan State, and he said, I tell you what, you know, it's my son gets $3,300, and, man, that's good money where I come from, and $3,300, you know, ain't $1.5 million. Now, his son wouldn't get $1.5 million, but here's what I'm saying. Some people, some players are going to get what they deserve, and it's going to be a whole lot more than that. Oh, yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Just give it what I don't understand. And, and I had another fan tell me this. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, if I was 
a president or an AD at a college. Now, I want you to remember this when, when you say this to, to people listening. If I was an AD or a president of a college and that player decided after one year he was going to leave and go pro or he was going to do this or he was going to do that or he's going to set out the bowl game or whatever he was going to do, I'd make them pay the tuition. If he went pro, I'd make him pay tuition. I'd make him sign the contract for the next three years. And I said, you know something? You wouldn't be able to beat Podunk U if you did that because you would never get another player. You know, if you are a fan, if you are uh, the AD at Wake Forest, you know, Duke, North Carolina, North Carolina State, Clemson, they're all saying, please do that because you would not get – you're not going to get anybody. Players, and yeah. they don't have to sign for that. They're not going to. So uh, people need to remember that, you know. And and it's what's funny was after he said that, he was like, well, I think we're going to get a couple of five stars next year. And I'm like, yeah, well, right. you, uh, y'all had that attitude. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be getting a, a one star. Nobody would go there for that. So, um, you know, it's just a, it, it's a different age, but I really, really don't understand the, uh, the, the just the resistance against it. I, I just don't. You know, I hear people say, well, my – and look, I paid – I put a daughter through, through uh, six years of college, just got done. It seemed like it was about 12 years. And I understand that, but as I heard a guy say one time, he said he he, he uh, a very intelligent individual, and a guy had told him he said you know, it's uh, no fair that you know my daughter was in college and she didn't get a scholarship or whatever like these players did and didn't get what they got, and he said you know something when. 80,000 people pack the bleach, pack the stands to watch your uh, daughter balance an accounting book, you know, then we'll talk. Okay. And they pay a hundred dollars a shot to do that or whatever they pay. So you, you got to remember, like I said, the market always balances itself out. These are different times and people will adjust. Remember when people freaked out when Olympians started getting paid? You know, I mean, you know, the, the ratings weren't great this last time around, but they were pretty good previously. So people adapt. If you like something, you're going to keep liking it. Very few people will drop off and not keep following it. And we're going to follow it closely here because David Sisk is on top of it. He'll be on top of the class of 2023. Keep uh, an eye on guys like Robert Dillingham, Gigi Jackson, J.J. Tanner, Matas Buzilis, and Mackenzie Mbako. There are five kids in class 23 that were offered by Carolina. Will one of these kids go to one of these uh, pay uh, for uh, play for pay leagues or will they go to North Carolina and maybe make more? That is a part of recruiting now, and Dave will be on top of that. And it really starts in earnest with the class of 23. Good stuff, David. Appreciate it. I know that you want to have this conversation. It's important that we got it out there. So I appreciate uh, everything that you put into it. I just think it's different. It's more of a big picture about college yeah. sports. And it, it's, it's, I, and I think, and look, people don't have to agree. And look, I know there'll be a lot of disagreement with what I've said, but the things that I'm saying have kind of evolved, but they go back to the early nineties. I mean, I, I've, I've said for 30 years, players should get paid. So, like I said, I'm, I'm not, whether I'm right or not, you know, there's one thing, at least I'm consistent. I'm not Johnny come lately on this issue. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Cause when first time I one of the first times I talked to you about, we actually had that conversation. This was before people were commonly using NIL uh, on stuff. So kind of seen it coming for a long time. For me personally, uh, I, I, I used to, when people asked about guys getting paid before, and I know we're going to sign off, but I'll throw this out there. Um, you know, I, I've seen Phil Ford a lot for years. Now I'd see Phil Ford around campus, something like that. Very, very nice guy. And every basketball game I've ever been to that North Carolina was involved in, and this means anywhere, with the exception of last year during the COVID year. But 
I go cover them in Ann Arbor in a game. I go cover them in Las Vegas in a game. I cover them all over the place. I always saw someone in a Carolina jersey with number 12 on it. And it's only going to be Phil Ford because nobody's worn it since it. And Phil Ford hadn't seen a penny of that. Even after he left school, he wouldn't see a penny of it. And I always thought that's wrong. A guy like Phil Ford, he should be paid for his likeness because that 12 is his likeness. That was his sweat. That was his effort. That was his relationship with Dean Smith that made him the legend that he is. The school's made a ton of money off of it. And he hasn't made, I mean, I know he does signings and gate speaking engagements, that kind of thing. But man, those jerseys have cost a lot. And he hasn't gotten a penny from it. Uh, NC, NC State, Philip Rivers, go to an NC State football game right now. You'll see a thousand people wearing number 17 at least. And this is 15 years. Now, this is uh, 18 years after Philip Les do a pass for the Wolfpack. I know he's made plenty of money in the NFL, but that's his likeness. He deserves money from that. I'll go to a smaller degree. Uh, a decade ago, probably say 15 years ago, I was uh, on an SEC campus and I went into the bookstore. And they had a big uh, pin of cleats. They were game-worn cleats by that team. And they had the number of the player on the back of the cleats. So if you were, let's say it was North Carolina, and it had number 50, uh, they had, what well, was Lawrence Taylor? Was He wasn't 56. He was 98. 58. Yeah. So it's got number 98 on the back of it, or it's famous Amos Lawrence. You can imagine what those are going for. Now, if it's David Sisk and it's number, he don't even have a whole, he's like number uh, two thirds or something. <laughs> that's on the back, not to be confused. W-O with 23. But instead of 23, mine was a two slash three. All right. So those go for nothing. All right. But you look at those other ones, like you're saying. So I'm thinking even then, these players, their used cleats are being yeah. sold. Yeah. They and not they're not money. getting, and I knew it would, you know, when you sell pair cleats, you're not going to get much, but for that, but you're not getting anything and they're basically taking everything you had on your likeness. They're selling them. They had them up yeah. on racks and the best players were up on the racks. And then the, the ones that weren't as good were on the bins. But, you know, those shoes, people were paying a little, a hefty price. You so you Alford. think about it in how do these guys in professional sports um, who played years ago, did it make near the money that they do now? How do they stay not relevant? How do that relevant, but how do they pad their pocketbooks? They go to all these memorabilia and autograph signings. You know, you see Pete Rose all the time. They're always interviewing him at one of these things about not getting into the league. Professional wrestlers, they do these things all over the country. You know, and these guys will show up. They'll make more. These old-timers, they'll make more in one autograph signing than they made in a year. Hey, I'll tell you what. What they did. And so, you know, that's how they – look at what that was worth. And then, you know, the college players did, did that. And it was their blood, sweat, and tears. And then, you know, I mean, not a penny. You remember, you don't know about baseball history. You know the name Whitey Ford, or that yeah. pitcher for the Yankees. And in 2003, I was in Cooperstown. Uh, a buddy of mine went, and I went to go watch Eddie Murray's induction to the Hall of Fame. And, and I was working with the woman to Star News at the time. And I decided, you know, I'm going to be up there. I'm going to write some stories. Every day I wrote a different story about the Cooperstown experience. And, and I, I kind of stumbled upon a story one day, actually, Walked around and had my, my tape recorder with me just in case I saw someone I wanted to talk to. We go into this shop to buy, you know look at stuff. And right there, sitting at a table about 25 feet into the store was Whitey Ford signing autographs. And there's like 25 people in line. And um, I actually ended up interviewing him for the story. And I talked to the shop owner and they said they paid him $1,500 for one hour. Yeah. This is Whitey Ford. He hadn't, at that time, he hadn't thrown a pitch in what, 40 years, 45 years? And he we got fifteen hundred bucks for one hour just to sign his name and pose for a few photographs, and and he was doing it all the different shops, and there were other guys there. Pete Rose had his own thing going on and stuff too. So, yeah, they can do that. They can make that kind of money, and it's uh, p- pretty amazing stuff. Uh, that now at least they can make money on who they are, when they're popular, when people know who they are. 
you know, the Whitey Ford thing, you know, guy that pitched for the Indians in the 1960s isn't going to have, isn't going to resonate to say it was a guy that was great for the Yankees. So um, anyway, the money's here, the money's there for these kids. And I, I agree with you, the market will determine all this stuff. And the guys that go to North Carolina, they're going to have a higher ceiling of, of, of income potential than guys that go to a lot of other schools. I, I know this. I live, I don't live far from Alabama and a town that I'm pretty close to here all the time. You'll see over the summer, uh, two, three, four ex Alabama players will be at such and such store and Florence signing, you know, autographs and they're lined up out the, it's unbelievable. And I'm sure they probably do the same thing in North Carolina, but yeah. the Tennessee Titans will have a caravan. Uh, they go all over Tennessee, Northern Alabama, Kentucky, you know, Northern Mississippi and all that. And they did that um, at a Buffalo Wild Wings of Florence. And at that time it was Marcus Mariota. And, you know, I wanted to get it. He'd had, you know, he was kind of a sensation for a time. And so, man, I want to see him just, just go and, and – Man, they were lined up. So I stood in line down there. You had to take a number. So I'm like number 122, let's say. The stand fanboy. Hey, they stopped it at 120. <laughs> so I stood down there for two hours. And I tell you what, I did another one. Carl Malone, and I was a huge Carl Malone fan. Carl Malone, and this is 1998, 99, somewhere in that range. He opened up an outdoor store. It was called Carl Malone Outdoors in Pigeon Forge. And I stood in line two hours. And now he gave away free autographs, but the whole take was, the whole gist was, you had to buy something from that store to either get an autograph or get your picture taken with him. So there's no telling how much they sold out of that store. I was in line two hours before I got, so that, that, you know, that just kind of gives you an idea. You know, in college football, they have the, you know, meet the pack day, meet the devil's day, meet the, meet the Tar Heels day, meet the heels day. Uh, they didn't do it last year. They're not doing it this year, obviously, because of COVID stuff, because it's their, their dog Uber protective mode again, but understandably, those days are over. Those college team autograph signing sessions, those days are probably over because there's value to that. Sam, why would Sam House sit there and sign for an hour and a half for free? Because if it's a team sponsor, well, how brutal free, it is. When, yeah. when he could go down the street and, and sit in front of an ice cream shop and sign for an hour and a half and make five or 10 grand. If you listen to coaches, who used to coach college and now they coach pro and you ask them why they like coaching. Will they go back to college? And they say, no, number one, I don't want to do the Tar Heel caravan or the demon Deacon caravan or the uh, Gamecock caravan or they whatever. Hate that stuff. Yeah. I, I don't want to go all over the state and speak to all these alumni functions every night and sign autographs for five hours. And they just don't want to, they don't want to deal with that. You know, they yeah. go pro, they coach and that's what they want to do. So, uh, you know, we, you, the, the players can't like it either. So. I think this is our longest podcast ever. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I think we crushed I it. Lose, I hope we didn't lose there by 30 minutes ago. Yeah, but I mean, you know, I think we're having a kind of conversation a lot of other people have it. And uh, people have to have these conversations and listen to them and read about them in order to adapt and adjust to the way things are. And I think people are going to do that. Go back to what I said 40 times. I think people will adapt for the most part. College sports fans, it's a DNA thing. It's a culture thing. And in the end, if guys are scoring baskets in the Dean Dome or guys are, are running across the goal line at Bryant Denny Stadium, that's what people care about. And that's what they're going to support. And I think in some ways, fans are going to start rooting for their guys to make the most money because it's just like college football fans. How many seats does your stadium have? People pound their chest about that stuff. Well, how many guys do you have on your football team making 100 grand this year in NIL deals? People are going to pound their chest about that too. I guarantee you they do that in the SEC. Fan bases, fan bases brag on how much our coaches make. Oh, I know. I so know. trust me, if your coach makes four million dollars a year, and mine 
makes 4.1, I'm not going to get angry about it because he makes 20 times more than the next highest paid state official. You know, it's bright. It's like, man, my, my, my coach, you know, or how about this one? The taxpayers are, the taxpayers are putting $4 million a year for him, you know, so they're proud of it. This is kind of a new thing too, because a lot of the bigger schools that are pouring a lot of money to football, they all got million dollar coordinators now. If your school doesn't have two million dollar offensive coordinator and a million dollar defensive coordinator, people are going to think you're not committed to the sport. Yeah. And people post about that too. So I think in the end, you you want to know as a fan that there's a commitment. And then you want to have that feeling that your program is a big time program. And conference realignment is proving that because what you're going to have. We know what's going to happen. We're going to have three, four at the most super leagues, and it's going to be the top 48 programs or whatever, and 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 their fan bases are praying to God that they fit in somewhere in that. You know, you, you take West Virginia. You know, West Virginia is what they're saying, please, ACC, take us. You know, because this is our only hope. If you don't get in, you're in trouble. And every fan base wants to be in that group. And yeah. if you are in that group, you want to be number two or number one, not number 41 or 42. You know, you want to be up – you want to be at the top. West Virginia and the other big college schools want to be in. And, and this is a different – we'll do we'll do something on this in another podcast, but there are some fan bases – it might be paranoid that their schools can get squeezed out because they don't bring to the table what they're getting right now. These are schools that have been in P5s for a while. And you mentioned one of them earlier. At some point in time, leagues are going to have to look at some of these smaller private schools that don't have huge bases and aren't going to generate a lot of streaming money. Hey, wait a minute. Why are we still supporting you? Why are we propping you up? So West Virginia's saving grace might be getting swapped out for one of those schools down the road. We'll do that another time. I don't want to go there now because we've we've passed the hour mark in this podcast for the first time. So I think we've passed like the hour and 10 minute mark. But you and I could probably go on for a long time and we'd have two listeners by the time we hit. <laughs> it'd be us two. It'd be us two and it'd be yeah, Dino. Somebody else. Dino would Dino would be driving somewhere to see some recruit. And, I don't got to know what David and Andrew said. So <laughs> she'd listen. Uh, All right, good stuff, my man. Thank you. Right. All right, he's David. I'm AJ. Thanks for stopping by and hanging out for a while.